So, I, the things that I've got covered with you so far include all of the uh, so-called required aspects of the treatment and, and, and some optional ones. But the, the rest of these are, now, uh, are all now uh, in the optional category. And remember, the basic idea is you do the case formulation, you decide which modules you're going to use. We ask people to include uh, mood monitoring, goal setting, pleasant activities, problem solving, and cognitive restructuring across all 13 sites because we wanted to make sure all kids got basically the same treatment. In your practice, you don't have to be restricted to that. You can, you can decide which of those you want to use. Okay? If you feel like somebody's already plenty involved in pleasant activities, then you don't have to do it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about this modular idea. This is, modular, this is a modular type of treatment. There are several modular treatments around. Uh, there's one for anxiety disorders that uh, Bruce Chorpita has a book on. Uh, this one is for depression. Uh, John Weiss, I think yesterday, made reference to this project he's doing in, the, in a couple states, in, in Massachusetts and some other state, where, where they're doing community mental health center things, and that's a modular treatment. So what is a modular treatment? Um, I want to talk about the characteristics and the pros and cons of it. So first of all, it gives you a lot of flexibility between sessions. You can choose a module that is most directly related to the needs of the adolescent. For example, if you have a borderline adolescent or kid that's cutting or self-harming, you can do the affect regulation module early. We'll talk about that more. I talked about it yesterday, but I'm going to talk about it a little more in a few minutes. Um, or if you find out that the parents are very detached from the kid, you can use that attachment recommitment uh, module that we did this morning, early in the treatment. Okay? You can also individualize the pace of treatment. You can devote more than one session to a given module or topic. Um, you can adjust the treatment to the pace of the adolescent, so you can push some kids faster if they learn faster and they seem to be benefiting from it, whereas you can slow down for other kids who are, are slower to pick up the material. And this is all dependent on their motivation and your relationship with them and their uh, intellectual ability and their cooperativeness, okay, and probably their family's involvement too. You can sequence the treatment on an individualized or tailored basis. So for example, an example I gave earlier, if you want to do family problem solving, you might want to do family communication first, but you might not have to. If the family already communicates fine, you don't have to do that. Just go right into the uh, problem solving module. You can flexibly involve family members. Um, you can do psychoeducation with parents. You can do interactive family modules that involve the parent and a teenager. Or you can do both. Now, in the, in the, pro, in the 13 site project, we were very worried about site differences. So we, we didn't want to have site differences because that complicates the results. So we, we really pushed people to follow some rules that I think, in retrospect, were probably not a good idea. Like, we, we told people, you have to have at least one interactive family session. I, I can't think of any reason that really makes any sense. I mean, we were just trying to make sure they did the thing the same way across sites. But you don't have to be bound by those rules when you're not in a clinical trial. Um, you can make modifications for specific families. So for, I talked about the first example, but the, the second example is if you have an oppositional or a substance using kid or a kid who's acting out, you can use the module on a parent contingency management. So what are some benefits of this? Now, this is, I, I should contrast it with two other ideas. One other idea is a 
a more tightly scheduled sequence of sessions. Like if you, if you look at the coping with depression course for adolescents that they did in Oregon, everybody got the same sequence of skill training in groups, okay? So this is more flexible than that, okay? Um, and one of the reasons we did it this way was we thought it would improve retention. It would help kids to stay in treatment and families to stay in treatment. And we did get very good retention. Most of the dropouts from the CBT condition dropped out before the first session. They just didn't want it, basically. Okay, so they dropped out. But once they got into the first session, we had very few dropouts. Second, um, Therapist satisfaction. Therapists don't generally want to be told in their, in their routine practice that they have to do everything in the same way with every patient. And so it's, it's an advantage in terms of therapist satisfaction to use this kind of fle more flexible approach. Third, you use a case formulation, which on the one hand is more demanding. It's more demanding of the therapist. They have to articulate what they're thinking. But they're really thinking about it anyway, so you're just pushing them to write it down or, or articulate it. Uh, the next advantage is it gives you some ability to address comorbid problems. But I want to come back to this later, because this is kind of a dicey issue, how much you should spend time on the comorbid problem. But for example, if you have an oppositional kid who's depressed, you can put some elements in the treatment to deal with the oppositional features. If you have an anxious kid who's depressed, there are some elements of the treatment to help with the anxiety. Um, this is a, a, a limitation uh, of the field. Right now, there's no one key therapeutic process to overcome major depression. You heard Wendy talk yesterday about exposure and how she would use exposure with any anxious kid, and so would I, because there's lots and lots and lots of evidence that the way to get over an anxiety is through exposure. I may add cognitive restructuring to it, but I'm always going to get the kid to try to move toward the thing they're afraid of. So if they're afraid of spiders, I'm going to bring some spiders in you know, and have them see spiders in my office. And then we're going to go for a walk and look at spiders in the woods. And we're going to look at movies of spiders. And we're, the kid's going to be so sick of spiders when they get out of the treatment, they don't, won't be phased by them. Okay? That's exposure. So in anxiety, you know that exposure is the key to success. It may be enhanced by cognitive restructuring, but you have to do the exposure, I think. I think that's what the evidence looks like now. And in depression, we don't have any one thing like that. It'd be nice if we did. Now, what about the downside? The downside of a modular treatment is you can find yourself drifting all over the place. If you're changing every week, and you're modifying your treatment plan every week, and you're throwing one thing after another at them, your treatment is going to be more chaotic than flexible. Okay, so you don't want to do that. That's not a good uh, practice. You may miss something that should be addressed. Um, the treatment may become too complicated. We, you heard a lot about this yesterday, the argument in the field about whether treatment should be simple or multimodal, multifactorial. Uh, this is not a simple treatment. This has many components to it. The therapist may try to do too much or cover everything. And a final thought about, about a limitation is that uh, this is a treatment that includes both individual and family sessions. Now, I think in practice, uh, I think in practice most of the times when I've worked with kids, I have had some family sessions. So in a sense, then, it's kind of realistic. But in, in the TADS, the way TADS was done, if the kid had a family session that week, they did not also have an individual. They did not also have an individual session. So some people think that maybe that weakened the treatment because we use family sessions to replace individual sessions. So that's something to consider. Now, you know, financially and insurance-wise, that's what you have to do anyway. But but ideally, maybe it should be done another way. So given all these challenges or 
limitations of the modular approach, what holds it together? First, the good case conceptualization, the case formulation. Second, psychoeducation. Third, transparency. That is, the therapist always explains to the people what they're do why they're doing what they're doing. There's no mystery. It has to be clear. Um, collaboration. Uh, session to session linkages and summaries and going from basic to more complex skills. And if you read the manual, this becomes pretty clear, and I talked about it briefly yesterday. So at the beginning of treatment, the therapist makes up a case formulation, and at week six, they look at it again and update it. And then at week 12, there's a session called Taking Stock. And Taking Stock uh, is an idea that Paul Rohde contributed um, it means you look back on the treatment so far and you try to decide with the adolescent and the parents which of the skills seem to be helping, you know, which are working, okay? Is this a kid who's really, who's really tuned into problem solving and that seems to be carrying the day? Is this a kid who loves to set goals and wants he or she determines the goal, they are going to meet the goal, so you want to capitalize on that. Is it somebody who's very good at cognitive restructuring, they really like this, it's like the light bulb went off in their head, and that's helping? Or is it some little idiosyncratic thing, like uh, one kid in the trial um, found the most helpful part of the entire treatment was the safety plan. Once they made the safety plan, they were good to go. I mean, it was unbelievable. It had nothing to do with anything that happened after that. They just loved that safety plan, and they kept thinking about it, and that kept them motivated. And I'm sure they learned some other skills, too. But the point is that it's very individualized, what is working for an individual kid. And so the point of the taking stock session is to review what progress has been made and what skills have seemed to help. And then you use that to guide what you're going to do in the next six weeks, between weeks 12 and 18. And this is more capitalizing on what's working. And then maybe adding a few things, but mainly capitalizing on what's working. A similar thing happens at week 18, which is re it's called relapse prevention. And in the relapse prevention session, uh, you review with the person uh, the progress they have made, what skills have seemed to be helpful, and um, how they might use these skills in the future if they run into a stressful situation. Okay. So you have to ask them what they think might come up in the next six or twelve months that could be stressful. So it could be like graduation or getting a car, um, having a birthday, uh, something happening with the family, moving, you know, whatever they, whatever they may be anticipating. And then you practice with them how they would use the skills in order to cope with that, with those events, okay? This is all in the manual too. So the case formulation sort of follows these four points. You have the baseline initial assessment, the first case formulation, then you update it at week six, then you use it at week 12, uh, you update it again at week 12 to talk about what you're gonna do in the remaining sessions, and then you finally finish with it at week 18 where you use it to guide uh, ideas for relapse frequency. Now, I know that in your practice, you're not always going to be able to see people for 18 weeks. So the way the program is, and we weren't able to all see them all in 18 weeks, for 18 weeks either. So the way the manual is set up, what we think are the most important parts of the treatment are in the beginning, so that people are more likely to get them. And then the more optional things come later, okay? Self-harming. Um, we did not screen out for borderline features. I'm sure some of the kids had borderline features. We didn't have a lot of borderline kids. 
We did have some who had done self-harm. And this is the, um, the, we only had one module on this. Okay, so it's, um, if you have your slides in front of you, it's on the next set, it's on the next, it's on page four, okay? All right, so then I would uh, uh, use this emotions thermometer, which is here. Oh, there it is, okay. And I would, uh, I don't know, how, how would you label that feeling? What would you call that? I mean, just for shorthand. Yeah, the feeling of the guilt and the blame and the loathing. And there doesn't seem to be any single word that really yeah. captures it. Okay. Um, okay, let's call it worthless. Feeling worthless. So then I would use this thermometer and I'd say now, What's the time when you felt the most worthless that you can remember? Okay, and that would be, I would describe that event at number 10. Okay, and that may be sometime when she actually did harm herself, presumably, right? And then I would say, now, let's go down to, this actually goes down to zero. At zero, I would put, think of a time when you didn't have any of these feelings at all, when you were doing something enjoyable and pleasant. And I'd put that at zero, okay? And then, now this takes a little time because you have to fill out some more of these blanks, right? So think of a time when, you're, when your feeling of worthlessness was around an eight, what was going on then, okay? And how about some time when it was around a five, okay? And then maybe one other. So you've got at least five anchors along the right-hand side of this column ex extending from feeling perfectly fine to feeling so bad you start to hurt yourself. Now, the next two steps are the most important, is that is, at what number do you feel that you've lost control? Okay. You can just make it up. Maybe seven. Okay, so we, so we call seven the boiling over point. This is your boiling over point. You're no longer in control. Therefore, you must come up with some things you can do before you hit seven. At what point do you think you got enough control to do something, but you're getting close to seven? So maybe it'd be a five, you know? Say four or five. All right. So we're going to call four or five your action point. At action point, you've got to do something. And then the question is, what do you do? Okay? So, this is very idiosyncratic. Um, here's the outline of steps that I just went through with you. That's the next slide. You, you probably need to involve the parents in the... It, it, you have to involve the parents at some point in this discussion, either early on or later after she's decided what to do. But she needs to decide on things that she can do which will be effective in helping her to go back down the uh, thermometer, okay? Now the advantage of her deciding what to do is that she can no longer come in and tell you that, you know, you gave me a lot of lousy things to do. <laughs> So it's another advantage for trying to get the kid to, to decide. What does she like to do? You can go back to your pleasant activities schedule. What pleasant activities might you be able to do at this point that would start to make you feel better? Are there any social activities? You know, people you can call, people you can go out for a walk with, whatever, okay? And then you bring in uh, the parents at some point in the session so they know the plan unless it's a, a 18 or older, 18 years old or older, okay? So that's kind of what, this is the only one we had in the manual. If you go to the Tordia, well, the Tordia doesn't actually have a manual, but Tordia combined TADS and a couple other manuals, and they did use more DBT things. So DBT has lots of stuff on this. It's a whole section on this. Uh, there, were, there was one slide that I missed, which, uh, This just has some possible distractions on it. I forgot to mention this. So the key thing is to find out with the girl or the boy, it's more often girls, but not always, 
uh, what they can do to self-soothe. And uh, these are some things that people have mentioned, kids have mentioned over the years. Uh, and then there you can, but you go to the, if you go to the DBT book, there's a whole bunch of possibilities. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about medication, and then we'll do whatever else people want to do. So, let me, uh, let me pull up my slides. These are the last slides in your packet. So I'll tell you how we did this in TADS. And, um, and then talk about how this compares with what routine, what's usually routinely done. <clears throat> so in TADS, we had a two therapist model. So the, the kids who got combined treatment um, saw a CBT therapist for that, and they saw a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner for medication. So they saw two doctors or two clinicians. Um, and so they were seen more often. They had, you know, that wasn't controlled. They had more time with the provider than people who had only one treatment. Um, and the two therapists were uh, supposed to communicate with each other on a, at least every six weeks, if not more often. And each one of them rated the child's improvement on the uh, Global Improvement Index. Um, so if a CBT therapist thought the kid was getting a lot better, they could convey that to the medication provider and vice versa. Or, and also if they thought they weren't getting a lot better, they could convey that to the medication provider. So the drug that was used in the study was fluoxetine or Prozac which is the one that has the most evidence for effectiveness in adolescence. Um, has several studies. Um, not many, but several, you know, a few, two or three. Um, and the dosage was started at, <coughs> excuse me, the dosage was started at 10 milligrams in the first week, and then it was raised to 20 milligrams in the second week. At week six, if the, if the child was uh, not, if they seemed to be responding a little bit, but not very much, and they were not having any side effects, the prescriber could go up to 40 milligrams. And then uh, at week 12, using the same guidelines, if they still had room for improvement and they were not having side effects, they could go up to 60 milligrams. And that was the highest it was allowed to go, okay? Now, in practice, what actually happened was that most kids were between 20, the average was like 28 milligrams. And the kids who had both CBT and fluoxetine had lower doses than the kids who had just fluoxetine. That wasn't planned. I mean, it just turned out that way. Okay? So it seemed like getting the combination treatment permitted a lower dose. So the combination kids had lower doses than those who only had fluoxetine. So, um, why, why do I think this is the optimal treatment? Yes. Explaining it, getting going on it. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. Uh, um, well, let me, let me use this slide to try to answer that, okay? So there's some artificiality in clinical trials by, by definition. The people who come into clinical trials uh, know that they're going to get randomly assigned to a treatment, and they have to be at least they have to at least say that they're willing to take any of the randomized conditions, okay? So people that were adamantly opposed to either treatment wouldn't come into the trial. So we kind of didn't have to deal with it in this trial because they, they were already there. They knew the trial was... Um, and um, that's an artificiality of a clinical trial. And it has all kinds of implications. I mean. 
what does it mean to be in a clinical trial and know that you're not getting medication? That's what the CBT kids had. What does it mean to be in a clinical trial and know that you're not getting CBT? That's what the two, the medi placebo arm. So it's all kinds of weird stuff that, that fo follows from the design of a trial, which is different from what you face in, in daily practice. Um, so I'll tell you what we did in the trial, and then I'll tell you what I do, what I do outside of trials, okay? So this is what we did in the trial. There was an initial session with the pharmacotherapist, which could be, in most cases, was an MD or otherwise was a family, a nurse practitioner, a nurse practitioner. And that was almost an hour in length, okay? And it's very similar to a psychotherapy trial. Uh, session where the, the, the doctor is trying to establish a therapeutic alliance with the kid. There's actually a small literature on the therapeutic alliance in pharmacotherapy. Um, they, have to, they have to build trust. They have to uh, explain to, uh, they have to listen to the kid and the family describe the problem. They have to try to make sense of it in terms of a medical model. Um, they have to establish what the target symptom is and give the rationale for medication. So now what's the rationale for giving Prozac? Just from what you know, I mean, what is the rationale? Yeah, but what does the Prozac supposedly do? To prevent the reuptake of uh, serotonin. serotonin, right? So it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI. So the, the theory is, the reason you are still, you are stuck in depression, and I don't think anybody necessarily has to talk about what caused your depression, but the reason you're stuck in the depression is you don't have enough serotonin floating around in your central nervous system. And so this drug will increase the amount of serotonin in your system by preventing its reuptake. You know how at the synapses, there's a reuptake of neurochemicals and these drugs block that reuptake, so the chemicals stay in flow, right? That's the theory. It's the serotonin theory of depression. Um, so the provider also, after giving the rationale, discusses dosages, timelines, that is expected time for response, and side effects, okay? So as you know, um, the stimulant medications for ADHD have an almost immediate effect. You know, you can see it in one day. Whereas that's not true of, of the antidepressants, except in rare, I mean, I have rarely, in rare cases, seen a really kind of dramatic quick effect, but most of the time it takes a number of weeks, four weeks, five weeks, okay? Now, after that first session, in the subsequent sessions, the uh, provider met with the kid for 20 to 30 minutes. They reviewed symptoms and they reviewed side effects. There was a side effect form that the kids had to fill out each time they came in. And they, uh, you know, encouraged them to keep going, encouraged them to take the medicine, uh, focused on the hope and optimism. And if they had further questions about what the drug might be doing or how it was supposed to be working, they would talk about it in more detail. They were able, if the kids were doing very well, they could convert office visits to phone visits, okay? And, it, well, this is the dosage thing that I mentioned earlier, 10 to 20 and then possibly to 40 and then possibly to 60. But most people were in the 20 to 30 range uh, throughout the trial. Now, I, want to, I, I think I showed this on Wednesday, but I want to show it for a different reason here. This is not typical community care. I mean, most providers don't have this many visits. This is the visit for the pharmacotherapy or for the kids who got either Prozac or placebo, okay? So you have a visit at week one, another visit at week two, a phone visit at week three, another visit at week four, another phone visit, another office visit, another phone visit, another office visit. They could convert these later office visits to phone visits. So while this trial was going on, 
the concern about suicidal ideation in uh, kids taking antidepressants came up, and the FDA called John March and asked him to send all the data from TADS of, of pertaining to the kids who were on either fluoxetine or placebo. And then they called him up to testify. Uh, and they were trying to figure out side effects and risk and benefit and so forth. And the bottom line, the outcome of all that was that the FDA recommended this schedule. This is the schedule that's recommended to providers to use if you're doing antidepressant treatment of adolescents. So this would be considered standard of care. And it does include the, the conversion of the office visits to phone visits if kids are doing well. But standard of care is not giving somebody Prozac and saying, I'll see you in a month, or I'll see you in two months, OK? And the psychiatrist on the trial said, you know, this is not what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis in most communities, OK? So it's a better, it's a better care system. Um, I talked with you about this Wednesday, so I'm not going to belabor it, but at week 12, the combination was the most efficacious treatment. Fluoxetine next, CBT was third and not significantly better from placebo, but CBT had the biggest impact on suicidal ideation and later had the biggest impact on suicide events. So this is the slide I showed Wednesday, week 12, and then treatment response, that week, week 12 treatment response, that is the percentage of kids who are much improved or very much improved. And you can see that in the placebo group, the improvement rate was 35%, which is, it is pretty much what we wanted. You know, you get a lot of trials, drug trials, um, they fail to beat placebo because the placebo response is so high. Like, it's not unusual to have a 50% response rate to placebo in studies of depression. So that's why we tried to only take in kids that were really moderately to severely depressed who had been depressed at least six weeks and had functional impairment in two out of three possible settings. Now what that means, though, is that the CBT response rate was also lower than you would expect in some other uh, population. So if you have a general outpatient practice, you're going to see a lot of kids who are mildly depressed or mildly to moderately depressed. And, they, and more than 43% of them are going to be likely to get better with the CBT alone if they're more, you know, in the mild range. And then... Uh, well, that's the suicide scale. I showed you that the other day. Now, the important point here is that all of the conditions were associated with lower, lowering the suicide ideation scale, including Prozac alone, which is uh, it has the it's the uh, the line with the diamond on it. So that also let me go over here. Combination comes way down. CBT is, didn't start. This is where they started. So those are the two that did that. So this is where it gets a little tricky. His parents ask me, and they do, you know, is it safe to put my kid on fluoxetine? Because there is some risk of uh, suicidal ideation early in treatment mostly early in treatment with kids that are on antidepressants. Well, one factor is that just reducing the depression does reduce the risk of suicidal ideation, and you get that effect with the Prozac, okay? Uh, here's the, I showed these the other day, too. So the treatment response for the three active treatments goes from these numbers to these numbers to these numbers. And this is a graph showing the same thing. So my read of this is CBT is slower, but it really picks up 
steam, um, especially between week 12 and week 18, as maybe some of these skills are getting consolidated. Clinically significant suicidal ideation, this is, they start at those percentages. So you can see that, as it turned out, just by chance, the kids that got assigned to the combination treatment started out with higher levels of suicidal ideation, 40% of them, whereas it was more like 25% in the other two arms. And by week 12, the fluoxetine group hasn't come down as much, but the other two groups have, have come down quite a bit. In other words, the two groups that include the CBT have come down more on suicidal ideation. And then at week 36, it's sort of more of the same. Okay, so, so fluoxetine is not raising the overall level of risk of suicidal ideation for the whole group. It's bringing it down, but it's not bringing it down as much as either CBT or combination. Suicidal events over 36 weeks, this is actual suicide attempt or a significant increase in ideation, there is a higher rate of it in fluoxetine. So I had a parent ask me about this a couple of weeks ago. I recommended to the, to the parent that uh, I, I've seen a child for, you know, about two months and uh, with limited improvement for depression. And I recommended to the parent that we add a medication. And the parent doesn't want to do that because of the fear of um, suicide. So I, I agreed with him that there was some risk of suicide, but um, that in, at least in the TAD study, the risk is a lot lower in combination than it is in fluoxetine alone. And what I was proposing was basically combination treatment. Yeah, so, so the point is that uh, there is a, a certain amount of any of these treatments that is attributable to hopefulness and um, encouragement and, you know, the high probability that you'll get better. And, and that's why there is, placebo is a very potent intervention. In fact, you could make a pretty good argument that everybody ought to start out on placebo and see what happens. <laughs> Except then you'd know you were on placebo. It's been written up in medical journals yeah. about it. Yeah, yeah. John, did they examine other medications besides fluoxetine? Uh, not in this study, but there have been other studies of other, other medications, yeah. And there, there, I don't have those slides with me, but uh, there are some nice reviews of different medications on the question of suicidal risk, and they do vary. Uh, uh, SSRIs? Uh, well, effectiveness for different SSRIs varies. So the, I think that fluoxetine and Lexapro, sertraline, and not sertraline. Sertraline in the anxiety studies, Zoloft and, and uh, Yeah, that's in, in the anxiety studies. But, but I think in, in depression, I think it's fluoxetine, uh, Lexapro, and Celexa that have some supportive trials for, for effectiveness in depression. So have we pretty well decided that for adolescents and teens that Prozac is the best SSRI to start initially? Well, it's probably the best to start initially because it has the most evidence. It doesn't have an enormous amount of evidence. It's not like the evidence in the adult literature, but it has, I think, I think well, yeah, counting TADs, it's three studies. So two by Graham Emsley at Texas and the TAD study, they all showed the same thing for effectiveness with depression. Um, venlafaxine or Effexor uh, does have a slightly more risky profile for suicidal ideation. So that's, people, uh, that is, that's an SNRI, right? Uh, selective norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitor. <laughs> um, I mean, it has some efficacy evidence for adults, but in, in adolescents, it's less frequently used because it has a little more, uh, more risk of suicidal ideation. And Paxil is generally not used because it has the worst risk of suicidal ideation. In fact, in Britain, it's not allowed to be used with kids.
You don't see it here anymore. Either. No, it's kind of kind of disappeared from treatment of depression. So what's the cutoff age? When you're talking about adolescents and adults. Eighteen usually. Yeah. What magically happens at eighteen? You don't know. <laughs> in, uh, in the brain that... Well, we'll have to get um, we'll have to get more fMRI studies to find out. <laughs> We'll stop funding all clinical trials and just do FMR. Um, I don't. I mean, I think it's just that that's when the group is, is delineated. But but uh, the changes aren't right at 18. You know, it's just that adult studies usually in, recruit for people 18 and over, and adolescent studies recruit for people 12 to 17. So there's nothing really magic that happens, except that in, in many states they become. You know, yeah, they become adults for various reasons. Um, and adult studies have always just done 18 and above. So you get, read adult studies, you get people 18 to 75 in them. You know, I mean, it's hard to believe that that's one group. But that's the way they recruit. So, um, so what is it about these medications that they're, if they're supposed to alleviate mm -hmm. suicidal thoughts, how is it that they... Yeah. That's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. But now, I mean, the magnitude by which they might increase the risk is—it's still pretty small. So, um, if I, don't quote me on this because I'm not exactly sure of these numbers. But I think it's something like uh, the difference is between two percent and four percent risk of a, of a suicidal event in a short trial. So it's a bigger risk, but it's still a small risk. Uh, one theory is that they activate people. You know, there's, you know the old, remember the old, uh, I mean, when I learned the MMPI back in, you know, back in the last century. Right, one of the things we were taught about the MMPI was that uh, the depressed patient becomes more at risk for suicide when their depression starts to go down because they have more energy. So this is one of the theories about the, the medication effect in suicide. That, uh, the risk is really because they're still depressed, but they have more energy now than they did before. That's one theory, OK? I, I mean, there are others, too. I don't really know what they all are, but is nobody it, knows the answer. Is it more about ideation than actual? No, this is about actual attempts. This is actual attempts. Yeah, yeah, actual attempts. Yeah. Um, or, well, it could be ideation, but it's serious ideation. Ideation that in, involves intervention. You know, that somebody takes them to see the doctor or they take them to the emergency room. It's not just a kind of a passive ideation. It's more serious. So that's that Columbia classification scheme. So I wanted to put this thing up uh, at the bottom. This is the Columbia system. This is what's being used by the FDA now to classify events as suicidal events. So when they got all the TADS data, they sent it over to Columbia, to the group there that does this work, and they had all of the descriptions of the uh, things that had happened, and they codified them as um, suicidal events if they, were, if they were an actual attempt, or if they were a preparatory action, like uh, getting pills together in order to make an attempt or looking for a place to harm yourself um, or ideation that was um, accompanied by seeking medical attention. So not just passive ideation, but ideation that raised concern enough that the kid was taken to the doctor or taken to the emergency room, but did not include self-harm without suicidal intent. So the, case we talked about earlier of the, of the kid who was cutting herself in order to feel better would not be counted as a suicidal event in this schema. So when you read the studies now, look to see if they use this Columbia system. Most of them do. And that will give you a sense of what they're talking about. Why I think combination is, is uh, the best treatment. Um, because both in TADS and in TORDIA, the combination um, had better results than um, treatment with medication alone. But 
Here's, this is the caveat. Uh, the kids in combination treatment knew they were getting medication, okay, in both studies, okay? So it wasn't totally blind. So in re to really be convinced that combination treatment is better than one treatment alone, we should have had a condition where kids got CBT plus placebo, right? The only reason we didn't have it was financial. There just wasn't enough money to, to, to recruit 125 more kids and, and continue to go on and on like this. So it was not that people didn't realize that would be a better design. It was just that it was, the thing was already so expensive. And the idea of adding another 100 and, uh, I think it was 120 or some a group, uh, wasn't done. And also because it's never done in, in reality. So it wasn't considered to be that, that important. But you have to remember that when, when you know, you're talking about combination treatment being the best. In addition to having the best outcomes on depression, it had better outcomes on safety, and over 36 weeks, it had better outcomes on cost effectiveness. So, of course, at week 12, the most cost effective treatment was just Prozac, because it's much less expensive to have, the Prozac only costs about a dollar a day. It's maybe even less now. Four dollars a month. Four dollars a month in a generic, okay? So fluoxetine generic is very inexpensive. So all you have to pay for is the, is the visits with the doctor, and there are much fewer than in psychotherapy. So at week 12, given the fa even given the fact that combination was better, fluoxetine alone was more cost effective, okay? Now then when you, every time my tie hits this computer, I think I'm, <laughs> So then when you go out to week 36, it changes a little bit because more of the teenagers who were only getting medication had to get an extra treatment during the rest of the time than those who were getting medication plus psychotherapy. And uh, the schedule was that up to week 18, up to week 12, they got weekly psychotherapy, and between week 12 and week 18, they got either weekly or every other week, depending on how they were doing. And then after week 18, they only had three sessions. So they had a session uh, at week uh, 24, 24? Yeah, 24, 30, and 36. So they had three sessions. So it wasn't like a lot of CBT, they had three sessions, okay? But over that time, the kids who did not have a psychotherapist had more uh, adverse events. They had more uh, uh, hospitalizations or visits to the emergency room, things that hiked up the cost. And that's why when the cost effectiveness people came in and did their study at week 36, combination treatment was the most cost effective. So that's another reason I argue in favor of it. So now, here's a couple other arguments that, that come up, and you may have thought of these yourselves. Uh, should you start everybody on combination treatment right away? Okay. So, for whom would you start on combination and who would you not? Okay. Okay. Probably wouldn't. Okay, so that's that's a uh, that's one way to address this problem. You, with if it's mild depression, you can start off with psychotherapy alone, and then if that doesn't seem to be sufficient, you could add the drug. I don't have any studies that I can point to for that because they they haven't been done. But that's what a lot of us do in practice. Yeah. When I see a lot of the vegetative kind of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So that's another signal you could use. Okay. Yes. Are there excuse me, are there studies for those adolescents who take either lithium or Abilify in addition to the antidepressants or have been antidepressants? They're not bipolar. They're Yeah, they're just depressed, yeah. I don't think so, but there are, uh, there are clinical treatment guidelines that talk about that, like the Texas 
There's a thing called the Texas Children's Medication Algorithm. And uh, the first author is uh, Carol Hughes, H-U-G-H-E-S. And he's got an article. Uh, I, I was in the conference, so I'm listed as an author, but I mean, it's really a medication thing. Uh, it's published in uh, the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. It's called the Texas Children's Medication Algorithm. And, you know, it's based on expert opinion. It's not based on studies. And, you know, so it was mostly the psychiatrists uh, trying to formulate guidelines based on what they think of as good practice. And they did talk about lithium. I don't think they ever talked about Abilify. I'm a little worried about these Abilify ads for uh, depression. I don't know where they're, I don't know quite what to make of them. I mean, that's a really powerful drug. That's an antipsychotic. So I'm gonna, I, I try to answer stuff like this in terms of the TADS manual, but the TADS manual was written for clinics. And if you are gonna use it in schools, you'll have to adapt it in a way that makes sense in, within the constraints of the school, you know, the time constraints and the access to the family and all that stuff. So anyway, this is what we would recommend clinic in a clinic for, for a family where this was an issue. That is the, the module on expectations and reinforcement for the parents. Now, like any, I mean, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the salesman here and I'm going to tell you we got a module for this, we got a module for that, you know. I know that you've got to have a relationship with them before you use a module. Right, that's right. So if you can get the relationship along far enough that the parents will meet with you, and, and you might have to meet with them more than once because you might have to meet with them first just to kind of get to know them and um, uh, let them know that you understand what their um, point of view is, then you could use this module, which is on expectations. So the, the relevance of this module is that uh, there aren't that many things that are typical of depressed families as opposed to un other families. It's not like conduct disorder or substance abuse where there's a whole bunch of literature showing that parents have trouble monitoring and they have trouble with consequences. And you know, There's very little known about parents of depressed kids that is any different from any other kids. One of the things that showed up in one study <laughs> It doesn't show up all the time, but one of the things that showed up in one study is that parents of depressed kids tend to be more critical of their kids than parents of other kids, or they tend to be more uh, less likely to give positive comments, pro positive reinforcement. So that's the relevance of this skill for depression. So the, in the case you're describing, um, it seems like there are both of those elements that in some ways perhaps one of the parents has expectations that are too high and uh, especially around academics and maybe other things and that maybe one or both of the parents also um, for you know maybe they're just frustrated or something but they're not giving much praise to this kid and so making a modification in the family environment would be Helpful, probably helpful. Now you're not probably going to affect much in one meeting, but if you had several meetings to work on this, that then it, it might be good. Um, and I, I think that it sounds like if the expectation is around academic ability, then somebody, either you or somebody in the school, is going to have to meet with the parents to, to give an interpretive about what it looks like the child's ability is. Has, do you know whether anybody has, oh, yeah, he tested and, and, and did they meet with the parents after uh, the testing? Yeah, I think they did because they had to, um, to conduct the IEP meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so then my question would be whether both parents actually they don't agree. agree on it, right, no. okay. All right, so. They're at odds with one another and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He just does not comprehend. Okay. I wonder if he has any kind of developmental. Oh, he does. I mean, he has learning disabilities. 
But like, he doesn't seem like he's grasping that abstract concept. Right. And I think it's because he's so negative on himself. You know, he just shut himself down. I think it's gotten worse over the last like year, maybe or two. And one of the um, one of the preceding events that happened was I think he acted out uh, inappropriately. He, he used he kind of came onto the teacher or used very sexual words or tones with her when she was giving instruction. She's a young, you know, probably attracted young woman, but she, you know, she was she's a good teacher, you know, she mm -hmm. wasn't going, you know, doing anything to provoke this, but I think he maybe expressed his frustration with something that he didn't understand by this verbal, very inappropriate verbal behavior. So what happened was the administration decided that he should move to another class science class, but he's moved to a much higher science class and science and math are the other things that he really sucks at them. You know what I mean? So he's having a hard time. He's moved into a class that he has absolutely no background in. They move very quickly. They use technology and he's just clueless. Oh, that's really hard. So yeah. he's drowning. Yeah. You know, he's yeah. Uh, well, I, I have the same concern that you mentioned about the possibility of a more pervasive kind of d developmental problem. I mean, um, you know, the, the, is, is there an IQ test that's been done? Okay. So he might lack that, that visual mode yeah, or yeah. You know, processing that I have. Well, I don't know whether it could be done, but I would recommend getting a school psychologist to sit down with the parents and really go over the testing and, and really go over the meaning of the testing. Now, my criticism, I teach, I teach testing, so I'm very critical of it. You know? And I used to do testing, lots and lots and lots of tests, I still do personality testing. But I find that, and then I may be totally off base, so just, you know, but it's getting late and I can say whatever I want to <laughs> say. Um, a lot of times parents do not understand what the tests say, and it's not the parents' fault. The report is not put into ordinary language. The score, the meaning of the scores is not interpreted to them. The implications of the scores are not interpreted to them. So if he has a learning disability that affects math and spatial skills, and that affects his, his uh, athletic ability, that really needs to be explained to the, to the parents. If on the other hand, he's got something broader, you know, if his intellectual functioning is uh, uh, impaired, impaired in, in ways that even affects his, his inhibition of sexual comments, you know, then, you know, I don't know if that's personal impulsivity or something wrong with his neuropsychological processing. And that, that's what I think a, a good school psychologist would look at and try to make sense of and then try to convey that to the family. And that then would be very helpful to you because at least, at least they would have heard it. Now, you know, you're going to get stuck with helping them really accept it. All right, so anyway, if you get to use this module, this is the way it works. You basically, uh, you usually meet with the parents separately before this to lay the groundwork for it and talk about how high expectations can be a good factor, but they can also contribute to depression if they're too high or unrealistic. And uh, also, I don't know if this would be relevant in the case, some adolescents impose these on themselves and the parents really haven't. But it doesn't sound like that's the issue here. And then you talk about the importance of positive reinforcement. Uh, now, again, I want to refer you to some of the work of Kevin Stark on this because he has some nice material on explaining to parents the importance of positive reinforcement and how it changes the whole mood in the family and it moves things from kind of a downer to a more pleasant mood.
and it also increases the connection between people and improves the mood of the teenager. And I think parents sometimes, a lot of parents, feel like they shouldn't give praise for behavior that's expected anyway. You should do this anyway, why should I give you praise for it? Well, one of the ways, I mean, the way I answer that is, we're working on helping your kid to get out of a depression, so that's why you should do it. Even though, you know, you haven't done it over the years, but you can do it now to try to improve the mood. And then, just as you're doing with the child, you're trying to identify positive things that the adolescent does, either in school or elsewhere, or positive aspects of their behavior or personality. You can work with the parents to do that. Ask them what they, what, what they think their child does well, or what are some uh, characteristics of their child that they think are positive or valuable. Um, and then the homework for this session is usually to go home and try to increase the frequency of positive feedback to the kid. So, I mean, I realize that uh, you're going to have to do a lot of groundwork before you get to this, but you might, you might get to it and it might have a pretty good impact if, if the parents can both try to do it.